Welcome to the Profitable Farmer Podcast, where it's all about increasing the profitability of your farm by working smarter, not harder. G'day and welcome once again to Profitable Farmer. This episode, I'm joined once again by Terry Tran from Freedom Trader. It's been four and a half months since I had Terry on. And since then, we've had extreme fire events and the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, As many of you will know, Terry is our resident um, investment and financial investment sector specialist. And I'm delighted to welcome Terry back to join us just to give us his take on how the last few months um, through this pande- pandemic have played out in the share market and perhaps Terry's view of our national and local recovery and even um, perhaps a more global perspective. So with that in mind, welcome Terry. Great to have you back. Always glad to be back. Thanks, Jeremy. How are things in Sydney for you, Terry? And how have the last few months been for you and your family? Uh, been well. Uh, thank God. We uh, Health-wise, everything's all good. We've never got exposed to COVID-19. Um, of course, with the lockdowns, uh, but in terms from the the, the business wise, it's actually been very very busy. Uh, only because of the pandemic, with the the markets all panicking, and uh, in fact, um, and we were talking earlier, Jeremy, how uh, back in December and January we saw the markets already overvalued and stretched. So we ourselves exited the markets uh, with the majority of our portfolios back into cash. And when the pandemic actually happened, not that we we knew it was going to be a pandemic, but because we were in the safety of cash. Our portfolios actually stayed stable and, uh, in fact, went up versus the markets declining by 30%. And the same with our students as well. It's interesting to hear that, Terry. So take us back a few months. What was the decision point there? You um, obviously saw something coming when it first um, reached the media and reached the marketplace in a global context. What were the decision processes that you went through um, as you saw this pandemic taking place? Sure. Uh, back in December, January, it was more on uh, with stock markets, all about valuation. So what we generally as investors want to do is we want to buy things cheap. And then once they get overvalued, we sell them um, at a higher price. And I think that's the same with, with farming. When land is cheap, you take advantage to buy land. And at, up to a certain point when the things go too optimistic, and if there's an opportunity to exit or sell your crops at a higher price, you of course you will. So we saw that exactly the same thing. Uh, we bought Stocks that were cheap at one stage, but then they became too expensive from the valuation point of view. So we exited and locked in our profits then. And that was one side of it. But then come February, uh, there's an indicator that we use. And uh, we've talked about a lot about um, with Farm Owners Academy as well, the VIX uh, volatility index. And we saw that spike above that level of 25 that we were comfortable with. And that was literally the day that the markets began, in, uh, began their free fall. And we saw that. Um, and the rest of our portfolios, we, we, let, we let go on that day towards the end of February. So the warning signs were actually there, not knowing, of course, it was going to be a pandemic, but the warning signs of uh, stretch valuations as well as uh, stock market volatility were already there quite clear to, for, for those who knew what to look out for. So what's your take on what's happened since then? Um, you say that there was that spike. How did that then play out over the preceding few weeks? Uh, it played out quite badly because the spike, uh, when we talk about the volatility, there's a level. For example, it goes above 25, we start getting cautionary. Then once it goes above 30, uh, we go into sort of very protection mode. So um, if you've got profits, lock it, lock it in because expectation is the market's going to have a, a free fall. And of course, it did. And over the, the coming month between Feb and, and March, uh, the markets went into free fall and went down by 35%. So uh, the market literally played out to what we've seen in the past and you know they say history doesn't totally repeat itself it does from a pattern perspective but in terms of the severity we don't know how bad it would it would get and it went down by 35 percent. and track truth is it probably would have gone down even more if the government around the world didn't step in and uh literally save the economies because that would have gone into collapse even worse than the um, the gfc and of course going towards global depression so we're not a political podcast by any stretch, but what's your view on how we've performed as a nation and um, what's your take on our position as a national economy at the moment? I think we've done quite well because I believe, of course, Australia usually does follow the United States and whatever they do, we and, and the world always listens and sees what, what they do as well. And 
they learned lessons from the GFC because GFC, I mean, we can't believe it's what, what, 12, 12 years over a decade ago now. And back then they waited literally six, seven months before the government stepped in and had their stimulus packages. And they, and it was actually quite late. Therefore, hence why the GFC in terms of uh, stock market prices, asset prices, they declined by more than 50%. But this time it only went down by about a third. I mean, I, I say only about a third, but because they learned from the mistakes of 10 years ago, uh, GFC, this time they didn't wait that long. They literally stepped in about a month in and hence why they put a floor on the prices. Um, and the, the markets, of course, got optimistic and they literally came out, governments across the world came in and said they'll do whatever it takes to support the economy and which they have. Um, and uh, we as a nation, Australia, we have actually done very well from COVID response, uh, to the lockdown measures, as well as also the stimulus packages. I mean, nothing's perfect. Uh, they did, there are certain things, I think, aspects that they could have done better. For example, maybe on the income wise, where rather than everybody getting the same, or the, every industry and, and business getting the same treatment, uh, and also workers getting the same treatment, maybe they could have done a more of an income means test where it depends on their income. Because I know, I believe that some workers are not wanting to go back because um, uh, they're in fact getting paid more, if they're on part-time, for example, getting paid more than currently, just from the government uh, packages, getting paid more than their jobs. So they're refusing to go back, which makes it now hard for, for a lot of employees to now have their employees come back to work. And that's the same um, elsewhere in the United States as well. I certainly take your point that it, it, nothing's perfect in crisis. And so I think they did respond quickly and early. Um, and obviously there are lessons to be learned, but on the whole, um, we're fortunate, aren't we, really relative to other nations? Oh yeah, definitely. Uh, very, very fortunate. I mean, we, we see, um, and I think it was because we also saw New York as an example in terms of, you know, taking it far too easy uh, with their lockdowns and the spread being coming, you know, worse than what it should be. Um, and we went in and did into crisis mode and did what we need to do. And hence why we've gotten out of it quite unscathed in, from that point of view, on that perspective. So Terry, what's your take now or your predictions as to the stock market recovery post COVID-19? I believe that uh, it's now gone sort of reverse mode. And um, if you easily just look at the charts, you can see that the, there's been sort of this V-shaped recovery and uh, a V-shaped recovery is fine. Uh, the only thing is that the, the problems that persisted pre COVID still have not been resolved. I.e., for example, um, a vaccine hasn't yet been found. Uh, U S China trade relations have not, really fixed itself up. In fact, it's probably gone worse since the time. Um, at the same time, also US against the world is in, in terms of you know, pulling out of the World um, Health Organization. Uh, they've also really made a lot of people unhappy uh, in regards to the uh, World Trade Organizations for certain aspects of it. And also even um, recently, you know, pulling out trips from Germany and you know, from NATO, basically. So they've really made a lot of so-called um, all the relationships they've made over the past, you know, since World War II, uh, the World Wars, they've really almost gone reverse. And their major problems that we, uh, that has not been fixed and has actually gone worse. And at the same time, the data that's coming out from, especially unemployment data, it really, a lot of jobs you can you know, easily see, not even from headlines, but just seeing that uh, unemployment is, is, has spiked dramatically. And there's many, many, I think small, medium-sized businesses that, probably won't reopen up um, and yet people think they will um, like it's almost like a tap, but it's not going to happen that way. And uh, that optimism I think is unfounded. So the recovery I see is very, in a way it's temporary and there, there's a very high probability that there's going to be enough, another market pull, uh, pullback and from that, current prices. What could that look like? What was that? Sorry, Jeremy? another market pullback. What could that look like Terry? Um, it may, uh, what I, uh, I probably say it, it could actually, test out the the same as what occurred back in March, that the markets will pull back back to those levels and potentially even worse. And this is really dependent on also, you know, is there going to be a second wave of, you know, of a, of coronavirus? And if it does, then all bets are off. Then it's actually potentially going to go worse because you can imagine lockdown number one already created this, this much havoc, but then having another further lockdown again, then the, the global economy will definitely have a major setback. It's so interesting. So Terry, how are you behaving as an investor in the market when it is volatile more so than normal? And um, how are you mentoring your clients 
Um, uh, uh, number one, we're always, uh, we always invest, uh, I'll probably say invest scared. We're always very cautious. Uh, so we don't really care about the headlines so much. Um, the ups and downs, it's, it's normal with the markets. But we always look at, you know, what is data really telling us? So behind the scenes, is unemployment data spiking? Is COVID, uh, is there a, a dramatic, I guess, uh, impact from, you know, are, are the, the number of deaths, the, the number of um, people being, um, being affected, is it dropping dramatically, things like that? And what is actually happening to GDP figures around the world? Um, so we are looking at that. So from a, from a point of view of, um, from an investment point of view, and also our students, we always say that safety is paramount. Always look at the downside first before the upside, because the upside always looks after itself. And, you know, and also never have that, um, that fear of missing out, the FOMO effect. Because a lot of people see this recovery and they think that they've missed out. But in actual fact, opportunity is always there. It's going to happen. Um, the main thing is that being patient. And I think one thing that farmers do have is that they've got patience. So they usually always outperform the city folk when, they, when it comes to investing. So who's your approach or your underlying philosophy that we spoke about in our last podcast, Terry? Has that changed at all? Is it the same approach to making those selections and investment decisions even at this time? Or are you taking a different approach? Uh, always the same. Uh, the philosophy never changes. I think value investing is always at heart. So we, I always like to see buying things undervalued. Uh, so there's always a flaw to the pricing that we've paid. So if it drops further, great. Uh, we're happy to buy more. But then there's always a certain, every asset always has a certain level. And if we are able to buy that level, um, it's inevitable that the price actually always goes back up. Um, and we want to always, uh, when we invest, we always want to have that sleep at night factor. So no matter what we, you know, if we're uncomfortable with investment, uh, the best thing is to not get into an investment. There is no point in buying something, investing in something if you can't sleep well at night. So uh, that's been always our, our philosophy, invest in something and be able to sleep well at night. So just... For our new listeners, could you give us a bit more context there as to that, that underlying philosophy and approach that you take in and around value investing, Terry? Yeah. Um, so what I mean by that is that, for example, every, every asset, uh, whether it's property, uh, farmland, uh, stocks, there's always a, a certain value. And of course, with stocks, a little bit more different because you need to learn how to uh, firstly evaluate uh, how much a stock is actually worth. So if a stock is worth, for example, say $5, what we want to do is we want to pay either fair value at $5 per that, for that one, that share, or we want to pay less than that. And if you can buy at lower prices than that, then you've made a good investment in the, in the medium to long run. Plus at the same time, you've eliminated the risk because that asset price has already that value and you've purchased below that value. Um, and I think um, probably one, one thing you can probably say uh, as, a, as a metaphor is it's like going, going shopping. You know, when you go to Woolies or Coles and things are on, on sale, uh, you will usually want to stock up. So whether it's toilet paper, toothpaste or whatever, you know you're going to use it and you know that the product's good. You've always loved it. And like stocks, uh, funny enough, people get scared when prices uh, drop. In actual fact, we get excited. We like pr prices dropping. And when they get to a price that we like, we buy them in, we buy them and we keep them in a drawer. And until it goes back up, then we sell them. So we don't panic. We actually get excited. Has your short list of stocks that you are focusing on changed in recent times? Um, have there been companies that are now underperforming that don't meet your criteria and new companies? I think about Zoom and um, mm -hmm. some you know, more staple product companies. Um, are there stocks that you're now looking at more closely and more actively participating in than you were six months ago, Terry? Uh, yeah, definitely uh, we, we have. And our list has gone quite long. Uh, from the United States, we've got about 50, to, uh, yeah, between 50 and 60 shares that we're looking at in the United States. But same as Australia. Uh, I wasn't that much interested in Australia, but with the last drop that's occurred, and a lot of the stock prices actually still have not recovered in Australia. So that's got me excited. So I'm now looking back into those stocks. Uh, and um, I'm, especially in Australia, because being much a much smaller economy, we're looking at stocks that, have what I call irreplaceable assets. So the likes of, for example, Sydney Airport. There is only one Sydney Airport, and it's a very, it is a very profitable airport uh, when things, of course, go back to normal. Um, and um, other stocks that just can't be replaced that have, you know, that have substantial share, um, what I call substantial foot, footprint uh, in the market. The likes of, for example, Westfield Shopping Centre, Censure. So they've halved in price, and we get excited with that. Yes, it looks really bad from the, from the surface level, but in terms of location, the, 
where these shopping centers are located, it can't be replaced because they are literally quite dominant. Yes, we will go into, um, people are going to internet shopping, but their experience of shopping and things like that, I don't think that's going to change. That's still going to be there. So it's, yeah, uh, yes, certain shops um, and in terms of their rent will drop in the short term, but in the medium to long term, it's going to pick back up and it's just that recovery process. So it sounds like the mix of your investment um, range is changing to meet the current market. And it does make sense that where airlines and supermarkets are closed, they may well be devalued at the current time so that there could well be opportunity there. Um, are there other examples of that, Terry, that you would share? Yeah, I, I think um, airlines is definitely is one of them. Uh, tourism, uh, for example, the I know the, uh, the casinos, for example, um, they, they, they've been really devalued at one stage, of course, with tourism dropping. But then uh, at one stage, for example, um, let's say, give the example of um, uh, Sydney Casino and uh, Star. So Star Entertainment Group, they, of course, are having a... Uh, you know, they're opening one in, for example, in, in Brisbane. And that itself, uh, you can imagine, the entire star group was valued at $2 billion. But one casino, which is Queensland itself, that's going to reopen, that itself, that one Brisbane casino is worth $2 billion. But the entire star, it's like buying Brisbane's casino, but at the same time having the Sydney casino thrown in as a free asset. And it, it just didn't make sense from a valuation point of view. So they're the examples that you see where certain assets are, way, are worth more, but then they're, they're valued at panic prices and they're the ones that we want to look into. And people say, you know, where, where are the, the um, you know, what you said um, earlier, uh, Jeremy, about Zoom and technology. And yes, they are. But the, the, the issue there that I have is that they're actually, because everybody knows about them, they're way overvalued and we're not looking at those ones because you're now paying extreme prices because of the optimism. And being overvalued, if you pay that, there's a, a massive downside when things go wrong. So the opportunity in actual fact is it lies into the industries and stock and shares that have been undervalued, underappreciated and have not, in fact not gone up at not gone up since. And they're the ones that we look at because they're the biggest upsides because um, it's not in people's radars, but yet it's on our radar because we like them. And when things go back to normal, they're the ones that we appreciate the most, but at the same time have much lower risk as well. So longer term, how do you see Australia's recovery from this, Terry? Let's say over the next sort of three years. Do you have a view of that? Uh, I think three, it, it, now it, I think it's now going to be de, de, quite dependent on Australia being quite a, you know, our, our economy is quite small. I think of, what, two and a half to three percent of the world economy. So we do primarily rely on what happens in the United States and of course what happens in China. And one of the biggest things that um, I've seen is that we're sort of stuck in this, this rock and a hard place where on one hand, we want to be seen, you know, be friends uh, with the United States. But on the other hand, we've got, you know, which is our ally. Uh, but then on the, other hand, then we, on the other hand, we've got, you know, the, the trading partner of China. And, and we've seen in the past, you know, the, the recent month or two where, you know, when Australia wanted to do an investigation in regards to the origins of COVID-19 and what actually happened there, and China comes out and then you know, slaps on tariffs on our barley, you know, basically crops using that as a sort of a leverage factor to stop us from doing so. So it makes us very, quite hard to sort of move and really does depend on what happens uh, external to what happens to us. And we just got to play it and, you know, and, and negotiate along those paths. Yeah. Thank you. So... The other conversation that I wanted to explore with you was um, around self-managed super funds. Mm. Um, a lot of people were um, using those as their primary investment vehicle. Is that I mean, how, how do you help people make decisions around self-managed super, Terry, and whether to use um, those as your investment vehicle versus operating outside self-managed super? I think with self-managed super, one thing we need to know is that... Uh, Firstly, is that you know what you you need to know what you're doing. So if you're not confident on the investing front, uh, a, a a a superannuation fund investing in that is probably better because at least uh, you've got professionals looking after the money. So some people would just jump into you know I want to self manage super and they so they set it up, but then if they're not um, educated in terms of their investment um, education from that point of view and knowing what to do with it, 
then probably to stay out of that for the time being until they get educated. And I always say that you should start in your own name first, get uh, and start small, and then because scaling up in investing is quite easy, but get confident in investing on a small scale. And if you don't have a self-managed super, that's okay. A lot of our students start off and not have a self-managed super, but then they, once they get confident, say a year or two, then they transition in, uh, into self-managed super. So number one is definitely education. And it's important that you know what you're doing because the stock market is inherently risky if you don't have no idea what you're doing. So education is, is definitely very important to get that first. And then on the other hand, the, the amount is also very important because for, for ones who don't have a large account, opening up a self, uh, setting the setup costs as well as the ongoing cost of self-managed supers can be quite expensive. So, you know, um, you know, a figure that I'd probably like to say is maybe $150,000 to $200,000 on superannuation. And if you don't have that, then that could be quite expensive, especially when the returns aren't there to pay off the cost. Thanks, Terry. So coming back to the pandemic, mm-hmm. um, do you have any predictions on how um, things may change for us socially, um, economically, or from an investment perspective, um, as a result, there's a lot of narrative that things won't, we won't go back to where we were. How does that play out in your mind from a a social standpoint, but also from an investment perspective? Yeah, I think the way we work is definitely one thing that won't, that will definitely change because all of a sudden uh, a lot of companies they have found that they've been able to now transition to people working from home. And what that, what that means is that a lot of, for example, corporations, they know the phrase for a fact that they can save a lot of cost if people work from home, you know, maybe not all the time, but at a certain you know, number of days a week, or they have what they call hot desking and people just, um, sh- you know, sharing that, that one cubicle or seat and um, people taking time um, at, you know, Monday to Wednesday, you know, John works, at the office and then, and then of course, you know, um, Sally comes in the next day type thing. So I think work is definitely going to change. And there's so many companies already coming, coming in and saying that, uh, for example, like Twitter, they've come out and said that uh, it's unlikely that they, they're going to want, need, want or need their staff to ever come back to the office. So they're very happy seeing that the productivity has not dropped. And after, in fact, it's actually gone up. So from seeing that work has definitely changed. I also think that a lot of the, in terms of the investing front, real estate, um, the real estate investment trust that, for example, invest in office space, uh, the, the valuation is probably going to change dramatically because the demand probably won't be there as much only because of what I said earlier, that people are now going to work from home, then offices or companies won't need that space. Hence why uh, space is probably not as required then. And there's only one way when that happens, there's only one way where the you know, prices will, of course, drop rather than go up. So from the investing point of view, that uh, would definitely be, uh, be, be hindered. And from the industry and stock perspective as well, I think COVID, this pandemic has, has really opened up to what is possible in terms of what's happened to uh, what certain industries and stocks, how they could be affected when things don't go according to plan. As you can see, our airlines, for example. And uh, I think one also forgets the, the flow on effect. Um, an example I'm probably, probably good to use is example like airlines. At the moment, about 90% of, of airplanes are actually sitting on the tarmac. They're not flying because of obviously the lockdowns and people are scared of flying. But of course, airlines, you know, they're, they're the producer of airplanes, Boeing or Airbus, massive uh, demand drop from production of airplanes and then Boeing is sacking, you know, uh, letting go of a lot of staff, tens of thousands, in fact. And then with Airbus, Boeing, uh, they need jet engines. GE provides the jet engines. GE now loses that, uh, the, the production from jet engines. Then they're laying off staff. And then at the same time, GE also requires parts. And those small, medium-sized part business is losing a lot of business and they're letting go of staff. So I think this whole flow on effect has been underappreciated. And if you just have that think that, you know, this is sort of the start of it, there's, there's going to be a lot. I think I believe there's still a lot more pain to come, which hasn't been reflected uh, with the current stock market prices. Yeah, there are huge flow on effects, aren't there? When an economy shuts down, it, it affects um, deeply all supply chains. So it, it stands to reason, Terry, that as we mobilise the economy again, that there's going to be a lag and a real um, perhaps delay in 
um, the speed with which we recover, given the depth of the impact that it plays out through those supply chains. Definitely. I totally agree because a lot of people think that it's a, you know, it's like almost like a light switch. You switch on, you switch off. But as we know, it's not one of those. It's that flow effect will take years to play out now because uh, it's not like great uh, people are lockdown is sort of gone and people go back to work. Normalcy. Yes, it will happen, but it's not, it's not going to happen overnight. And the, the companies are going to be, especially the ones who have sort of either, you know, laid off staff or they've, they've shut their doors they're not going to have that 100% capacity because the, the, the customers aren't, simply aren't there yet. Mm. So they're going to be quite cautious on putting back on more cost until they're, they're quite certain that uh, business is back to normal. So it's going to be this, this slow, yes, we'll get there, but it'll be a slow transition in getting, in getting back there. So yes, it'll, probably, it'll definitely take years. Yeah, definitely months, if not years. We were speaking before the call about a certain disconnect between Wall Street and Main Street. Could you just elaborate on that for, for me, Terry? Thank you. Yeah, normally the, the, the Wall Street is seen as a, as a leading indicator, but in this case, it seems to be almost the opposite. Um, and you know, we can see that there's this V-shaped recovery in the stock market and everybody's very happy about it. But when you go to speak to accountants, financial planners, business people, farmers, the, the, the disconnect is on Main Street, life is not back to normal. Businesses are slowly opening back, but uh, I know a lot of, I've got a lot of friends in um, optometry and dentistry and they've seen a, a till to this day, uh, still at 80% to 90% drop in their business. People have, have not come back and they're still struggling. But yet at the same time, why are people so happy about the stock market thinking that things have gone back to normal? But in fact, on, on Main Street, it hasn't. So, and a lot of uh, businesses just, even the, from retailers to, you know, to pubs and restaurants, they have not seen business gone back to normal yet. Yes, you'll, you'll probably get there, but it's going to be months until that, that happens. Yeah, I think we're only in a, at a local level and certainly regionally, we're seeing a slow um, opening up of small business again. What has been really impressive is to see just how many of those small businesses have completely reinvented themselves and been incredibly adaptive in order to um, retain their team and maintain um, a base level, base level of revenue. Have you seen um, examples of real adaptability um, at the top, top end of town in some of these bigger companies um, where they've reinvented themselves um, as, a, as a result and their business models are now somewhat different to what they were? I think in terms of, uh, of mo even bigger corporations and small corporations, uh, they're definitely, they, they see the power of technology and the, the, the cost efficiency of, of technology. So for example, I know that many businesses now, for example, they've realized, oh, they can get on a Zoom call and they don't no longer have to fly their, 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 you know, their, their management team around the world negotiating certain things. And yet it can be actually done face-to-face -face on a Zoom call. And therefore they won't require the amount of um, you know, flying, for example, executive teams flying around the world, saving both time as well as money at the same time. So they're adapting to that new new phase of life. Yes, I, I think there's there's this thing about face to face, you know, negotiations. It's it's still great, you know, having a handshake and things like that. But I think that's going to dramatically drop from that point of view as well. And certain companies have have restructured, realizing that potentially using technology, they don't need as much staff now. Therefore, there will be cutbacks on that side of things as well. Um, and and that's on the corporate side. But then uh, going back onto the local level, just speaking to a lot of friends that have their, for example, their surgeries. They, they've realized they've taken the time out during the pandemic to really you know, check out, they finally have time to work on their business, look at their cost space. What is, you know, um, certain staff levels they've, they've come to realize they, they probably don't need. Uh, and on the, on the other hand, you know, where can that cost uh, or where, where can that money now go? And they're reinvesting at other, in other things. So I think a lot of from small, medium and large corporations, they're now seeing that, um, you know, having a sort of a, a bigger picture approach and having that time off to now see how to move forward and and adapt, like you said, adapt to whatever happens down the track. And they've learned from this as well. So bringing it back to agriculture, Terry, um, our view has been that for a lot of our farmers and as long as they've been able to access supplies, it's largely been business as usual. Um, mm. And to, to a large degree, and perhaps with the, the wool sector um, as the um, 
outlier here. It's it's we've, we're seeing real optimism. Um, meat, sheep, um, grains, um, and so. What's your view there on perhaps what you're hearing from your members who are farmers or mm -hmm. your view on the agribusinesses that you're monitoring? What's your take on um, the optimism that perhaps we're seeing in agriculture? Is that fair and accurate or do you have a different spin? I think um, in terms of, uh, it's actually really good to hear that you're saying a lot of the business, it's, it's business as usual, which is great. Uh, but one thing I think it's important to also um, know that uh, you know, at any point in time, it's, it's also important to one, be a bit more diversified in terms of, you know, uh, I guess one, one thing is their trading partners and who their customers are, having a more broader base. And the other thing is, I always believe whether it's farming or any other business, it's always important to be aware that things can happen, as you've probably seen, you know, as we've all seen over the last few months. It's also ensuring that, you know, wealth is also created outside the farm as well, while the, the farm is running. So therefore, it just gives that um, same thing as you know the sleep at night factor that no matter what happens there, they uh, financially they're okay and they can always um, you know, su su you know survive and prosper through even downturn or down down times. Uh, so I always say that you know ensure that when farming is great, ensuring that a, a portion of funds is gone outside of that to start building a portfolio outside of that, and not to not to of course quit farming because that's you know, that's the livelihood, but to ensure that. In, in bad times, no matter what happens financially, the family's okay. Yeah, absolutely. And it's with that in mind that we um, absolutely recommend Terry and the Freedom Trader coaching program. Um, we've worked with Terry and his team for years now, um, helping our farming community um, make that diversification into shares and equities. and. Um, value-based wealth creation in the in the share market um, and so for those of you who want to know more about how to make that transition and achieve that whether it's at this time or in the short term um, or longer term as you sort of set up your farm and optimize your farm and are ready then to look to diversify um, encourage you to jump onto the Freedom Trader website and reach out to Terry and his team um, he mentioned before the importance of learning the skills of investing first before you consider um, things like self-managed super funds um, and entering the market um, either locally or internationally. And we recommend Terry's training, his mentoring and the, the model and value-based philosophy that he um, takes to his investing, both as an investor himself and with his clients and students. And so with that in mind, if, if, if that is of interest to you, to you, jump on to Terry's website, Freedom Trader, and um, yeah, enjoy the ride. I know a lot of our clients are working closely with you, Terry, and getting wonderful results. Um, that's the case. I and mean, what is your assessment of your farmer client base um, and those members of ours that are sort of working with you? How are they going? It's actually awesome because we have um, we've got a, we've had done a couple of interviews with our, with your farmers. At the same time, um, every month we do a hot seat, and uh, recently we had um, a farmer go into our hot seat, uh, a Mel and Melinda uh, Crockett, and uh, they're broad based farmers in New South Wales, broad acre farming, and uh, they shared their experience and what's occurred, and of course uh, during uh, you know the fires that we've had, and, and of course the pandemic, and how they've been able to uh, have that confidence to now move ahead because. Uh, uh, it takes time, but they're at least build, starting to build their portfolio outside of it, and they, they're seeing that as well. And I mean, we've got over what 200 um, yeah, farmers already on our, you know, for, uh, and thanks to you guys of, of, of spreading the message, uh, we've got about 200 farmers already on our program. And um, uh, once this COVID 19 is over, I actually want to uh, bring my camera crew and start going back on the interview trail again and, uh, and go back and, and in interview and you know, uh, share the experience of all the farms that we've had on our, on our program. And uh, hopefully that inspires other farmers to, to jump on board it and start thinking about, you know, creating uh, what I call intergenerational wealth. So it's not just wealth for now, but being able to uh, one share, learn what they learn on the investing front, but then share that knowledge with uh, their, their kids. And, and we've seen a lot of farmers when we did an interview with a, a number of farmers, they actually said their kids, uh, this is their words, their kids are going to be the main benefactors of our education because we're going to be passing on this to them. 
So, and then that basically becomes now the, you know, the next generation, which is awesome. And at the same time, um, I think uh, if they can create, they can create that, that wealth outside the farm, then it just gives them that peace of mind to, you know, to even potentially, uh, I, I call it take, sometimes even take on board even more risk on their farming side because, you know, financially they're, always, they're going to be okay no matter what. So if they see an opportunity in farming on expansion, then they've got that mindset that, yep, yeah, I'm okay. So therefore they've got that, um, that I guess um, I call it guts maybe, to therefore jump into it and, and, and not fear that, oh, I'm putting everything into this, but because they've already got a portfolio, okay. And if it, even if it doesn't work out, they're okay financially. So I think that's actually quite important. Absolutely. Yeah, no, it's great to hear there. Um, that example that you used and absolutely we'd love to um, see you out amongst our clients with video teams and interviews. That'd be perfect. But we also look forward to having you involved in our events in the yeah. year as they open up as well. So Terry, really interesting to speak to you again. Um, I really appreciate the fact that with all the media hype and all the sentiment that's out there that um, you bring a real calm and a real level method and approach to what's playing out for us. And no doubt your team and, and your clients benefit from that enormously. So thank you for your words of wisdom today. It's great to connect with you again. And all the best over the next few months and look forward to seeing you in the new year. Thanks, Jeremy. Uh, always a pleasure being on, uh, online with you. Perfect. Thanks, Terry. Take care. Bye for now. Okay, bye.